Stanford University. Okay, so for today's um, final uh, session, well, as usual, are two lectures. One is dealing with sort of mathematical cognition and how the brain got to be able to do mathematics, at least a story that we can tell that we think is moderately plausible, or I think is plausible. Um, and then I'll finish with a sort of a grand finale by talking about the seven millennium problems, um, which means that other topics that I wanted to do, as I said in that email I sent out, will have to postpone. In particular, it occurred to me that I could do a whole course on infinity, and that would be really cool and undecidability. So probably next year I'll do a course on that. So for those who wanted that, I'll do it. Um, but it'll be next year. Uh, if my voice sounds a bit different, uh, the, the big question is whether I can make it through the next hour and a half and still have a voice. I woke up this morning with the beginnings of a sore throat and it's been getting steadily worse all the time. I'm now drugged off as much as a professional cyclist in order to get through the lecture. <laughs> so this is, this is, what you're going to see is, is a, a drug enhanced performance tonight. I, I'm, on, I'm on something. I'm actually, I'm on sort of throat lozenges and Sudafed and all of that stuff. <coughs> um, Okay, so we'll see how it goes. Okay, um, but the, the, the extra low tones in the voice uh, is just the, the, the voice about to disappear. Alrighty, so um, this was a question that actually puzzled me for many years because it was really, I mean, it's intriguing because mathematics is, you know, 2,000 years old to sort of formal mathematics, 10,000 years since we invented numbers. Um, maybe 35,000 years max before we had any kind of counting with notches and things. So it's fairly recent. I mean, way too recent to have seen any major structural changes in the brain or the body. Although you've got to be careful making statements like that because the brain is very plastic. But, but to all intents and purposes, we've got a Stone Age brain doing this modern stuff. And so the question was, how did the brain acquire that ability? Um, it's the, the capacities for doing mathematics must have been in the brain, latent, or doing other things, for, for many hundreds of thousands of years. Okay. And now that was puzzling, because mathematics is clearly kind of an unusual use of the brain. It takes a lot of training, it takes effort, it makes you tired, and it's, uh, it's powerful, but it's, it's an, an interesting thing. So there was this puzzle that I couldn't get my mind around as to how the brain acquired it. What was going on? How did our ancestors eventually come up with this way of thinking that's proved to be so so effective. Okay, and I spent many years thinking about this off and on and finally in the year 2000 I, uh, I wrote a book um, that uh, it began as a very thick heavy sort of scholarly tome and then you know I, by then in my career I wanted to make more people make, make my stuff accessible to more people so I, I ended up writing what's known as a sort of popular book in mathematics although this is really a thesis um, and the, uh, so this was the, the American version uh, with the subtitle, How Mathematical Thinking Evolved and Why Numbers Are Like Gossip. And I'll get to the gossip part later on. <coughs> but uh, interestingly enough, at the same time as I was doing this, as often happens, two other people were writing very similar books. There was Stanislaw de Hain, who I'll mention later on, in France, who wrote a book that came out about a year before mine called The Number Sense. Um, where he focused on how the brain does sort of n numerical work. He's a cognitive psychologist and does sort of brain imaging research. Um, that came out at, it was about a year beforehand and I actually pulled my book back from the publishers and added some material from his book and put some introduction at the beginning um, because I didn't, I didn't want to redo what he'd done about number. So I just reduced my coverage to a short amount. And then when my book was actually at the publishers, uh, I saw an announcement for a talk over at Berkeley by George Lakoff about a book he was writing uh, with Rafael Nunez, who's an old friend of mine, or an old colleague of mine at least, and I knew George vaguely. I've got to know him better since. Um, but, and I knew him as a linguist, so there was George Nunez writing a book which eventually came out called, um, I forget what they call it now, anyway, how do you... How the Brain Does Mathematics or something. I, I forget the exact title now. But in any case, they were bringing this book out. And when I saw the announcement of the talk he was giving at Berkeley, I thought, whoa, that's my book. Well, it turned out it wasn't. It turned out his book with Nunez begins exactly where mine stops. So we have these three books all in the same general area coming out at the same time. And in fact, George's book was with the same publisher. It was weird that we had the same editor. And at no point in the development had he told either of us that he had another book on the same topic. So, um, he was probably doing that knowingly to, to, to let us just go through our process. And we ended up with different books. And actually, we ended up on a panel together talking about our books. 
So these three books came out about the same time and that sort of cemented what became known as mathematical cognition, which is the study of, of mathematics as a way of thinking. Uh, and I've pursued that myself since then, thinking of mathematics as a way of thinking rather than a product that you apply. Think of it as a thought process. And in fact, a lot of my own applied research in the last 10 years for the defense department and various branches of the military and private industry has really been focused on applying mathematical thinking rather than applying mathematics. Uh, and there's actually a significant difference between those two, but <coughs> that would be a, that's another course, basically. Okay. <coughs> Uh, the title in the book was, was um, taking a very popular metaphor. Um, uh, you know, if there's a message in the book, and I actually nail this within the first few pages, is there is no math gene. You know, I'd been a college dean long enough to know that I wasn't going to listen to any students or parents trying to get exempt from a math requirement because their son or daughter didn't have the math gene. You know, and I had a book to back it up then that I'd written. So, uh, yeah. um, and if you think about it, it, it plainly cannot be something like that. I mean, it's a, it's a capacity, you know, just think of how natural selection works. I mean, uh, if, if, if some people, that sounds like my phone. If some people can do mathematics, it'll stop, was it my phone? Yeah, that sounds like my phone, okay. Okay, it's a feature of modern life, okay. It's also the ring that means this is a business call. That's, that's someone from the office calling me. <coughs> Okay, so um, if natural selection puts something in our gene pool, um, then it's sort of there for everybody to, to, to greater or lesser degrees. You know, it's, it's just in there, at least for large groups of people. So it's a capacity that somehow got into the human gene pool. And that was the interesting part. How did it get there? Um, interesting because you know, it's done in the brain, right, which is the most expensive organ in the body. You know, it's about 2% of body mass, and it consumes about 20% of your energy. So the brain, in evolutionary terms, by all accounts, is a non-starter. You just shouldn't have these huge brains that require, you know, we're born without the brain fully grown, it takes many years to reach maturity, you've got to have parental control and all that kind of thing. You know, masses amounts of time, you don't reach maturity for the first 20 years. I mean, it's just not a, an efficient organ, as an, an organ in terms of getting in the gene pool. So the brain clearly offers huge advantages, and we can all sort of guess what they are. Um, and recent research that was just published actually in the latest proceedings of the National Academy is more evidence to suggest that what enabled the brain to grow was cooking. Uh, it was the fact that when we cook our food, we get much more energy out of, out of it and that, uh, that fueled the growth of the brain. That's a thesis that's been around a while. In any case, I was looking at this sort of evolutionary development of the brain, uh, all of the advantage it conferred on our ancestors at great cost in terms of energy consumption and immaturity for many years and, and so forth. Um, and seeing if I could fit into that how mathematics got into the picture so that 10,000 years ago people could invent numbers and then you know, two and a half thousand years ago they could invent geometry so how did that get to be? Um, you can ask a similar question about language and I suspected from the start that the answer had to be bound up with language because language is equally puzzling um, you know I mean it's hard to say how language got into the brain uh, you know, I mean, people often say well it offers great facility for communication. Well, you actually don't need language to do communication in your local environment, right? You can go to a foreign country and providing you can gesture and you know a little bit of vocabulary, you can get by fine. You just need one or two words, you know, me, Tars and you, James sort of stuff. So, so what's known as proto-language gets you by. You need a vocabulary and you can point, but that's all, that's all you need. You only need language with all of its grammatical structure to talk about things in the future or the past or somewhere else in the world. Uh, to, f to form plans. You have to talk about complex things. You have to create models of mental models of the world. Okay. So uh, if language is not used for communication, I mean, it is used for communication, but if that wasn't the driving force in terms of evolution, what is? Okay. I mean, it clearly can't be. If you only need language to express complex thoughts, then complex thoughts are a prerequisite for, for the language, if you try to pull them apart at all. And so language only becomes necessary when you have complex thoughts. But when you start to think about it, having complex thoughts begins to sound like forming mathematical models. Um, so I always had this suspicion that mathematics came out of the same mental roots as language. Uh, and eventually, after fooling around and reading a lot of stuff about evolution of language, of which there wasn't a lot and still isn't a great deal, and looking around, it eventually came up with 
the thesis that got written about in this book. Okay, so the questions I asked, and it, this goes back at least 10 years before the book got written, how did the human brain acquire this ability? When did it acquire it in, in evolutionary terms? What else was going on? How many thousands of years ago was it? And what evolutionary advantage did it confer? Okay. I'm not even sure I'm going to have enough water to get through tonight, but we'll see how it goes. <coughs> and the approach I took was, was just a standard sort of scientific-like approach. I said, well, let's just split it up in this divide and conquer. Let's just split it into some questions and say, let's just not talk about mathematics. Mathematics is a broad subject. Let's split it apart into basic constituents, um, simple mental capacities, at a level of simplicity where we can tell a plausible natural selection story. Ask what led to the human brain acquiring each capacity. If I do it right, most of these are going to be obvious, just self-evident, we can just easily answer them. Um, and if we can easily answer them, we can sort of nail it from human evolutionary history. We can sort of nail it in our history as to when it was acquired. And then ask the, the $64,000 question, how and when they came together to give mathematical thinking. Because there was a sudden blossoming about 10,000 years ago where the whole bandwagon of mathematics went forward. And so what was going on 10,000 years ago that drove this? Um, you know, once you've got mathematics, it's very useful, but, which is the same for language. Once you've got language, boy, it's useful to communicate. But something else has to be going on in the brain to drive that acquisition of language. And um, the most obvious thing was constructing models, complex thinking, planning, uh, and a whole bunch of stuff around that. OK, so I came up with a list of basic capacities that go together to give mathematics. Uh, there's number sense. This is the one that Dehaene wrote about. Um, and he wrote a whole book on this. And you could write a whole book on lots of these. But his book uh, came out, as I say, a year before mine. And, and it was actually called, I think, Number Sense. I'm not sure whether I had the word number sense. I don't think I did. I think I got, the, I think I got that phrase from him or from whoever came up with it. Um, numerical ability, that's for sure. Uh, I think I just had something like quantitative capacity or something. I forget. I mean, numerical ability, uh, with numbers being different from, from number sense. Number sense isn't about having numbers. It's the sense of size. Uh, his term actually is a little bit misleading in that sense because uh, it makes you think of numbers. But it really means sizes of collections. Uh, numerical ability is really about numbers. Uh, so you have to have numbers to have numerical ability, but you don't necessarily need numbers for number sense. Uh, spatial reasoning ability, a sense of cause and effect. That's what mathematical reasoning is all about. The ability to construct and follow a causal chain, sort of chaining things together. Uh, that's believed by many people to be a driver of large brains as well. Uh, spear throwing was one of the theses that was put. I've read a ton of stuff on evolution. Spear throwing was thought to be a uh, something that drove, you know, when, when our ancestors got to the point they threw spears or rocks to, ca to, to, to kill animals because they calculated how long the brain would have. I mean, th th given the speed of doing that, there isn't enough time in sort of milliseconds for feedback mechanisms to correct the motion of the arm. When you aim, you have to sequence instructions to the muscle and fire them off down the nerves so that it all happens instantaneously. Or virtually instantaneously. So just the speed of it is too fast for it to be done on the, on, in, in real time. An algorithm has to be put together that s sequences the muscles to go forward. That was the story anyway. And I don't have the training to really judge between them. If it got published, I tended to, to pick it off the shelf. OK, so that was, um, uh, that was an important one. Uh, algorithmic ability. And some of these are related. Um, this is a sort of a cognitively reflective well, not even necessarily cognitively reflective, but a, a sort of an, a, almost an abstract version of number five, the ability to sequence together instructions, uh, like throwing for a spear. Uh, the ability to handle abstraction. Mathematics is inherently abstract. That was clearly um, a crucial thing on the, on the road. Uh, logical reasoning ability and relational reasoning ability. And at that point, I stopped. Now, th this is not meant to be minimal. Some of these are related. And indeed, part of the story I tell in the book is about the relationships. Um, but I stopped because I thought, there's nothing in mathematics that I know that isn't covered by combining these. If you've got these nine ingredients, you can bake the mathematical cake. Now, you know, this, it takes a good chef to bake a good cake out of ingredients. Um, so just mixing them in the bowl isn't going to be enough. There's going to be a lot in the, this is a souffle. There's a lot in the art of the, of the person mixing them together. But if you put the nine together, you've got the ingredients. So that was the thesis. Um, 
And then if we can explain, first of all, how these got into the gene pool, and secondly, gene pool, and secondly, what brought them together and how, <coughs> then we've told a story of where mathematical ability came from. And we have to give a rationale for why, at a certain point in time, about 10,000 years ago, this stuff was put together. OK, so um, the question was, when do each of these nine mental capacities evolve? What survival value did it offer? And what brought them together to give the ability for mathematical thinking? That's really what the book's about. Um, and it's a book because there's a story to tell about all of these. OK, so number sense, the sense of the size of a collection. You know, evolutionary stories for this are obvious. You, know, you, you, you waste your energy climbing. You use energy climbing the tree that's got more fruit on it. Uh, if you're outnumbered by a, threat, by a, a potential threat, you hightail it out of there. If you outnumber the potential threat, you stay where they are. There's lots of research on contemporary. By the way, I, a lot of the evidence I collected together was from contemporary work uh, with animals, people studying animal cognition and animal behavior. And many, many creatures have number sense. In fact, I, I, I collected together so much data on animal cognition that when I'd finished publishing the math gene, I ended up writing another book called um, um, the, num the, the I forgot what it's called now. Um, was it the number sense? I think it was the number sense. No, it can't have been the number sense. That was, wow, I forgot what it's called. Anyway, it was a book of, of articles about uh, animal cognition to do with mathematics. Okay. It's getting bad when you forget the titles of your own books. Hmm? Sorry? Must be yeah. Anyway, so, so yeah, tonight's homework is to find out what the title of that book was. Uh, <laughs> doesn't require numbers. Uh, many of these creatures that exhibit number sense don't have, uh, uh, don't have num any, any real sense of numbers. Um, possessed by many creatures, as I said. And you can find it in young babies. Within a few days of birth, there's been tests done by various people that show that very small children exhibit uh, this, this number sense. Okay. Uh, and some of the seminal work was actually done by Karen Wynn in her 1992 MIT dissertation, PhD dissertation. She was one of the first people that did this work for uh, small children. There's been a, hers were two year, two year old children, but since then there's been a lot of work in that area. Um, so this one is sort of fairly well uh, trawled by the cognitive psychologists that look at number. Uh, there's a bunch of them here at the medical centre that do this kind of thing. Uh, numerical ability, that's the stuff that requires numbers. Um, other than very limited forms with some you know, chimpanzees and bonobo apes and uh, various kinds of birds and rats. It's, you can train them to recognize certain things. Parrot, there was, there was a famous parrot that died recently um, that, uh, that was trained to do various things with numbers. But it takes a lot of training. They never get to be 100%. Uh, and it's clearly, you know, it's hard to say exactly what's going on. I mean, they certainly have behaviors that correlate with different numbers. So in some sense, they're, they're responding to numbers. Um, but it doesn't, you know, the, the best, they're, they're equivalent to a small two or three year old child. Beyond that, the humans just, just race away. And so it's really, uh, it, it's, it's humans that, that really have numbers. Uh, to the degree where we have accurate numbers. We can be really precise with numbers. Very large numbers. You know. uh, and it depends on language. There's plenty of research. Uh, De Haines research, Brian Butterworth's research and others. Uh, some, some of Stephen Pinker's work that links numbers to language. Uh, research that shows that uh, the two are really linked together. Bilinguals uh, are faster doing arithmetic in the language that they learnt it in. Um, and, and, and then whatever the second language was in terms of the arithmetic, they can never match the speed. In fact, it's, it's, if you look at the time differences, almost certainly what they're doing is sort of eventually subconsciously going back to the language in which they learnt it because the numbers are embedded in language and there's various things, Stroop tests and things that that have shown that. So numbers are very much linguistic constructs. Uh, and De Haines' work, the guy that wrote about the number sense, a lot of his book is about the connections between language and number. Uh, spatial reasoning ability. Uh, by the way, the reason for number, why, do we, why would we need numbers? Well, to be more precise about collections of things. If you look at the behaviors of the animals that learn it, it's all about making fine distinctions between different collections of seeds and things and things of value. So um, th there's an advantage to having more precise numbers, although it's, a, um, it, it's not clear that it's a sufficiently precise one to get it into the gene pool. But since it comes in on the, on the, on, on, on the coattails of language, 
um, we don't have to tell too strong a story for that one. You basically take number sense and language and put them together, and that little collection of two ingredients will, will give you numbers. Uh, spatial reasoning ability, well, moving. You know, swinging from tree to tree, uh, recognising where an animal is going to be when it's running towards you, all of this stuff about negotiating. Any, any creature that moves <coughs> must have a built-in spatial reasoning module of some kind. Uh, relational reasoning ability, how things are related together. Um, because we use that to understand human relationships. Uh, you know, one of the key things about humans is we are creatures of society. We form societies, we have extended families, and, uh, and that's all about uh, having and tracking human relationships. Uh, you know, huge part of, uh, uh, of human beings, right? I mean, you know, the, 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 these, these terrorist negotiations, I mean, the trick is you have to get, establish a relationship with the terrorists, and the moment you do that, things get diffused. Um, so human, and, and, and that depends upon knowing about them. Okay, so huge impact on our behaviour by human relationships. And of course, that's, that's what we do. I mean, here's a huge, a huge advantage for humans, right? We're, we're not the fastest, we're not the strongest, we don't have sharp teeth, we don't have long claws. I mean, we are weaklings, physically. There are creatures all around us that can beat the whatnot out of us and do evil things to us, but we can cooperate. We can be smart and we can cooperate, and that turns out to be a at least over moderately, over human lifespans, turns out to be a good strategy. Uh, I mean, there's no way we can outlive the ants, but that's another issue. Uh, okay, and they are going to be able to outlive the viruses, so you know, ultimately it's all viruses. Uh, they will inherit the earth. Uh, the ability to handle abstraction. Um, that, according to my story, was the key to understanding mathematics, how mathematics came about. Once you could abstract and collect those, in, those things together in an abstract form, because you had to abstract them to fuse them together. And once you did that, you got there. Sequences of cause and effect. We know that there's a driving force in humans to understand that because it's an obvious survival technique to know what causes what. And very young children get annoyingly obsessed with chains of reasoning. You know, they love chicken licking. Right? I mean, we've probably all who've had kids, we've all spent years of our life as parents reading chicken licking to the kids. And the kids just love that idea of one thing causing another, causing another. So it's, the learning about that's this huge part of becoming a human agent. Okay, so um, uh, the abstraction, I think, is the, is the key. Because when you abstract cause and effect chains, you get algorithms, you get proofs, you get deduction. Okay. And that one, and this is where I was lucky, I just saw some work in a research monograph about the origins of language, and it was written in such a way that when I read it, having been thinking about it for many years, he was talking about language in society, and I just read into it mathematics. I could have just gone through, in fact, I did go through and just replace all of the references with mathematics and mathematical thinking, and he'd written the thesis for me. So the chapter where I do this essentially was his, just co-opted for my purposes. Okay. So that lang mathematics comes out of the language capacity. So the hypothesis I formed and talked about in the book, uh, that the key step was handling abstraction, um, and it involved, uh, it involved the language module in the brain. Uh, by the way, the language module, we think, is, is no more recent than 75,000 years, and maybe as much as 250,000 years. It, the, the opinions differ as to when our brains acquired the capacity for language, with a grammar, a recursive grammar that allows you to construct potentially indefinitely long sentences. So, uh, you know, the proto-language, having vocabulary and sequencing a couple of words, me, Taz, and you, Jane, danger there, hungry, you know, that kind of stuff, lion, tiger, that could be a couple of million years. I mean, that, that was probably around a long time. But forming, lang forming these mental constructs seems to be very recent. And part of my thesis is, the moment the brain got that ability, it had the latent capacity for mathematics. What it needed was a trigger. Now, language was an easy one, because once you've got language, boy, you can use it to communicate. Uh, interesting, we saw that, you know, that was recapitulated with the internet. You know, the internet was not invented as a system for sort of communicating the way we do today. The World Wide Web came later, but um, boy, that's how it's been co-opted. <coughs> okay. Um, but one of the key things, though, I think, was that it's not a greater complexity of thought processes. 
you know, I talked last week about mathematical modelling. You just iterate this simple idea of abstract, 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 and you get all this useful mathematics. Okay, so um, here was my, uh, how I described it, and I'll summarise it here. If you want to understand mathematics, you should think of it as a fictional analogue of parts of the real world. It's about modelling the world. If you model the world in terms of human actions and human motives, then you've got language, you've got grammar. The grammatical structure is what allows you to chain words together to form complex descriptions. So what you're doing is you're modelling the world and you're articulating that model of the world and communicating about it. You're planning something, you're hypothesising how the world is going to be and how you're going to act in the world. Okay. And if you do it one way, that grammar gives you, I mean, it's just, it, it's, it gives you language. It gives you sentences and phrases and things that talk about the world in that way. But if you do it in a different way, in an abstract sort of quantitative, logical way, you get mathematical models of the world. And once you've got one, you've really got the other. And the fact that we know that language and number are tied close together sort of buttresses this. Um, so you think about the two as being just two sides of the coin. The trigger for language was instant because communication is a winning card. Um, mathematics, you had to wait until there was a need for mathematics. So society had to get sufficiently complex that there was any need to do it. But remember that the first lecture I talked about the, the, the invention of numbers as banking? People wanted to mediate trade and transactions. Um, society had to reach the level where that was necessary, and that was Sumeria 10,000 years ago. So you get to Sumeria, you've got this need for using this latent capacity, and pew, out it comes. It's been waiting there all those years. Um, and so now you've just got it as a, you should really think of it as a, just like a novel is a fictional analogue, or a movie is a fictional analogue of things in the world, so, mathematics is a fictional analogue of something in the world, but it's expressed in a, in a different kind of language. And to get it, we take these mental capacities that develop to negotiate the physical and the social world and apply them to reason about fictional abstract objects. You know, numbers, triangles, circles, lines and dots, as we saw in that cute little video at the beginning. Okay. Which means we actually know what the secret is to doing <coughs> mathematics. And it's that. And that was deliberately an in-your-face statement to just make people realise that I was being serious about this. Um, a mathematician is someone who views mathematics literally as a soap opera. If you think about what a soap opera is, it's a fictional analogue of the real world. We all know that the real world isn't in detail anything like the soap opera, right? I mean, really isn't. Uh, actually, the we there was a weird thing. After this book came out, I went on this book tour. And I was going around and I had this talk and I said, you know, we, uh, you know, the people in the first soap operas, you know, they're all beautifully turned out, they're all beautiful, they wear these wonderful clothes, they're gorgeous. And, then, and I'm talking and I'm, I'm giving my spiel and then it dawns on me, I'm in Santa Monica. <laughs> and in fact, half the audience, it wasn't a huge audience, uh, but half the audience looked like that. So I, uh, um, I realised that there are parts of the world where it, it, people do look like the soap operas. Um, but... Uh, and so I, part of the reason, I, well, let me, let me say a little bit more and then I'll, I'll, I'll give a little bit of flesh to this claim. Okay. <coughs> the characters, um, I, I don't mean the sex lives of mathematicians. Right? I mean, that, that's an interesting story in its own right, though uh, other disciplines seem to have a better time than mathematicians. Um, what I mean is uh, the characters, just as the characters in a soap opera are fictionalizations, they're abstractions from real people. So the, uh, the characters in the mathematical soap opera are abstractions from the real world. Things like numbers, geometric figures, and we see them all around us. We can look up, we can see circles, we can see straight lines, we can see right angles, rectangles. I mean, we can see the world around us in terms of these abstractions. Um, and, you know, we could replace this by a line drawing that represents the room, and then we've got an abstraction of the room. Um, and various more complicated things. So those are the characters. And in mathematics, when well in a soap opera, those fictional characters, the soap opera is about the relationships between them. Well, that's what mathematics is about. In the, in the, in the TV soap opera, the facts and relationships of interest are births, deaths, marriages, love affairs, and business relationships. But mathematical relationships are different. At least they seem to be different until you really dig down about them. Almost all mathematics boils down to questions like, are these two objects equal? What is exactly the relationship between objects X and Y? 
Find an object X that has property P. You know, solve this equation, as an example. Do all objects of type T have the property P? Do all right angle triangles have the property that the square on the hypotenuse is the sum of the squares of the other two sides, and so on? <coughs> or how many objects of type Z are there? <coughs> those are the kind of questions we're asking in mathematics. In fact, pretty well all of mathematics boils down to one of those five kinds of questions. But that's what happens in an episode of a soap opera. You find out about the, whether two create the relationship between two people, are they married, are they whatever, are they in love, um, what exactly is the relationship with them, uh, does Fred love Susie and Susie not love Fred, in other words, is it commutative or not? Um, there's all of these relationships, um, but this is really what soap operas are about, you know, the, 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 the procedural criminal series, find the crime, find the, find the person who committed the crime. Um, do all these people have that property? You know, that's the soap opera. All the soap opera does is lays out and shows you week by week all of the, the new things about the relationships. Well, that's what mathematics does. That's what a mathematician does when, they, when we do research. We, we establish these relationships. At which point you say to yourself, hang on. I have never found it difficult to watch a soap opera. I just sit there and it just flies by, and I understand everything that's going on. More or less everything, depends on the soap opera, but most of the things, there was always Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, but that was another special case. <laughs> Do you remember that one? <laughs> uh, yeah. How many people remember Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman? Yeah. Uh, for the face of those, this was this, this was this, you know, all of us middle class intellectual trendies got hooked on this thing because it was a counter soap opera. This was a soap opera that was a spoof of soap operas. So we just sit there for weeks on end thinking, well, I, mean, I don't really watch soap operas, but this is really clever. <laughs> and then you get hooked on it. <laughs> we all got hooked on it. And we were watching another soap opera week in, week out. It was really kind of funny to see that happen. Uh, I don't know if that was the intention of the guys who produced it, but it was a very interesting experience and it was a ton of fun. OK, um, but we don't find watching a soap opera difficult. And yet if you think about it, <coughs> The complexity of a soap opera is really quite high. Those characters, they have labyrinthingly complicated relationships. Uh, I mean, it's just unbelievably complicated. Much more complicated than anything you'll find in most mathematics books, up to first, second year university level. In fact, there was a, there was a, a, there's something you can, you can do this if you want to do a, an interesting exercise. You can, uh, you can watch a soap opera and you can write down you know, how many characters are in that soap opera what kind of things do you need to know about human relationships in order to follow that soap opera episode? You know, so how many characters are there? How complex are the relationships between them? How many relationships are there? How many different threads, be connections between them? <coughs> you can ask yourself basic questions about how the plot unfolds in a soap opera. And you can sort of note the numbers down. And then you can get a page of a mathematics textbook up to maybe first, second year university. And you can ask the same questions. How many objects are there? What's the relationship between them? How complicated are the relationships? What do you need to know about those relationships to follow the proof? And, and every time, the mathematics comes out way simpler than the soap opera. Human relationships are much more complicated than the mathematical ones. So by that simple metric, reading a page of mathematics should be much easier than watching an episode of a soap opera. And it's not. It's quite the reverse. You don't have to make any effort to watch the soap opera. You have to make a lot of effort to do the mathematics. So you've got to ask yourself, it's not the logic, it's not the complexity, it's not the complexity of the relationships or anything. In, in the TV soap opera, everything's more complicated. You need to know a ton of stuff about human relationships to follow why people act in that soap opera. In a, in a, in a piece of mathematics, you need to know three or four axioms. Commutativity, associativity, that's all you need. A bit of logic, and modus ponens and things. So the only difference between the two is that the abstraction in the soap opera is a pretty thin abstraction. Those characters are only slightly abstracted from the real world. So that soap opera pulls upon all of our knowledge of the world and human relationships. It's part of us. It just triggers things and we just immediately jump to those things. Mathematics, you have to create those abstractions yourself. They're not in the world. You have to create them, hold them in your mind, have available all of their properties. Even though there are not so many, you have to have them in the mind. And then you have to reason with them on top of that. The killer is the abstraction. It's the fact that it's abstract. There's evidence, to, if you read the book, there's all sorts of evidence that I sort of pull in and refer to in favor of this. But the main distinction between those two is the abstraction. Uh, by any other measure, TV soap operas are more complicated. 
In other words, what I say in that, what I, what I demonstrate in that book, <coughs> or the conclusion, I guess, is, is, is this. That first, of, I mean, the book is about the story that I tell about how this came about, the evolutionary story. But what I tell, uh, the conclusion you draw is that we actually, there's, there's not a different brain. Um, we're just using a standard issue brain in a novel way. You know, in, in terms of those evolutionary traits, it's what Stephen Jay Gould used to call an exaptation. We're taking something that was developed for one purpose and reusing it for another. And we did it because 10,000 years ago, society got a stage of complexity where it needed that. Um, but I will mention, by the way, that the subtitle of the book uh, was... <coughs> The subtitle of the book was Why Numbers Are Like Gossip. Um, that was the, 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 uh, the publisher's subtitle taken from the contents of my book. And one of the pieces of evidence I brought in to talk about the importance of relationships and why relational thinking was really what drove mathematics. If, if the list of those things, other than the abstraction, the thing that was the most crucial one, and I captured this in the soap opera analogy, was relationships. It's really the complexity of relationships. And there's a lot of evidence that anthropologists have together and sociologists have gathered about relationships and human relationships. For example, um, you know, the ethnographers follow you and I around, and they follow you and me around. I mean, I can't, the television really influences you. They follow you and me around. Okay. They follow us around, and they keep track of our language use. And they will tell us that every one of us this rich thing called language, this really evolutionary expensive capacity in our brains that lets us communicate, this, this language organ, two-thirds of its uses are gossip. They're talking about the relationships of other human beings. If you go to a serious newspaper like the Wall Street Journal, that two-thirds drops to about 40%. 40% is just pure gossip. You know, it depends, I mean, it's gossip sometimes about presidential candidates and things, but it's just sheer gossip. It's about human beings. If you read USA Today, it's about 80%. Even down at 40% in a so-called serious newspaper, that's a lot of devotion to gossip. Well, if all of that organ is spent on gossip, boy, that's got to be important to the human being. And of course it is. It's the, it's the oil... Well, there's two metaphors, the oil and the glue that fuse and smooth relationships between us, right? It's, it's, it's how we keep track of things. There was some other, some other interesting evidence that I collected, and there was a ton of this around. Anthropologists have studied various groups of people around the world, and there's various uh, Aboriginal groups in, in Australia <coughs> that, by all reckoning, don't have mathematics. I mean, you know, the, the standard thing was they don't have any sort of mathematical capacity. That was, that, was, that was what you read in, in, in sort of earlier books and things, that they didn't have <laughs> mathematics. And they certainly didn't have anything we recognise as mathematics. Uh, they didn't have geometry, for example, and they didn't have trigonometry because they didn't sort of look at space the same way. What they did have was an incredibly rich vocabulary for talking about human relationships. And they negotiated not in terms of geography, but in terms of relationships to other people. And then you can, you can, you can extrapolate from that to where they live and so forth. So it was all... Then this very rich grammar of human relationships. And if you look at that grammar as a mathematician, that looks awfully like algebra. These were fixed relationships and they had uh, all sorts of grammatical constructs to them. They could, very, they could go down chains of relatives and, and identify people. So they had mathematics. It just wasn't devoted to the physical world, it was devoted to the social world. They had a social mathematics. Um, <coughs> and so, uh, you know, the the gossip part is just that the key to mathematics is really the relational stuff. It was the complexity of Sumerian society that was, that was crucial. Because you know, money only makes sense if you have commitments between people. Those little objects only have value because people endow them with value. Those little squiggles on the, on the outside of the clay tablets, they had value because people endowed them with value. So it was all depending on the fact that society was complex. And in many ways it was an abstraction from the society. So this is, uh, I think, what we're doing, um, and indeed, this is definitely the case. If you look at, um, if I, I forget who did this, someone did this once. They went to a, a math meeting, and um, they filmed mathematicians talking to each other about mathematics. And then they took out the sound, and they showed it to people. And you could not distinguish that from people just gossiping about other people. 
getting excited, getting passionate, arguing about things. There's no way you could tell without the soundtrack that they weren't gossiping about people. They were gossiping about mathematics with all of the emotions that we have when we gossip. You know, the scurrilous glances and the chuckles and all of that kind of thing. That's what we do. We just take that capacity and we, you know, now it sometimes mean we have trouble with our spouses, right? <laughs> um, it is the case that mathematicians, when they're in the business, when they're in the groove of doing mathematics, they're devoting all those mental capacities to this, this mathematical world and the real world can sometimes get shortchanged. And anyone who's been, spent any time with a mathematician or even worse, married to one, will know uh, that that can sometimes have fallout. Uh, but my excuse is uh, that's the price we pay for doing mathematics. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a limited capacity in that brain. And if we devote it to one world, <coughs> we take it away from the other world. <coughs> but it's really the same capacities. It's just pulled away to this abstract world we create. And that was the story I tell in there. Um, I've actually thought about this since then, and I've written a couple of papers for conferences. Uh, one corollary from this is that um, I'll get some more water before I think. It does explain, at least to my satisfaction, um, why it is that when we do mathematics, we feel as though we're dealing with a real world. It's, it's known as Platonism. It's that this, mathematicians don't talk about inventing things, they talk about discovering things. There's this sense that we have, this overwhelming powerful sense that in mathematics we are discovering this world that was there long before people came along, long before the universe was there, eternal world, and we are making discoveries about it. Um, lots of metaphors about you know, going into a dark room and stumbling around and figuring out where the furniture is and then putting a small light on, then putting more lights. That's the, one of the metaphors for doing mathematical research. Mathematicians always talk about discovery, searching for the answer. They're all physical metaphors. Lakoff and Nunez in their book go into detail in those metaphors because that's, 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 that's Lakoff's thing. He, he finds metaphors in everything um, to greater and lesser degree of, 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 uh, of convincing, but, but that's what he does. <laughs> oh gosh. Not a good day. Okay. So, so you. Okay, that's probably enough about that one. But the, no, let me let me finish that one because this feeling of concreteness. Why do we feel as though the thing is real when we're doing it? Well, because we're using mental capacities that were evolved to deal with the real world. So those very capacities are rooted in our evolutionary history to real things, and so when we use them, they're going to carry that all of that stuff with it. So that sense of discovery, I think, is just a natural consequence of where those capacities came from. Uh, so even those of us who don't think mathematics is platonic, I, as I've got older and I think wiser, I've come to think that mathematics is essentially a social construct, a social psychological construct, and that it tells us more about the human brain than about anything else. It tells us how the brain encounters the world. But that's, be that as it may, even though I think that's what's really going on, the moment I start to do mathematics, boy, it feels like discovery of real objects that are out there. Those numbers are just out there, uh, waiting to be discovered, properties waiting to be done with them. But I think that's a consequence of the, uh, uh, of, of the way it came about. Okay, um, but if you want to sort of look for more detail, there was, I was going to think of another point I was going to make, but it's, it's, it's gone, my head is beginning to get uh, thicker as, we, uh, uh, as the evening goes on. Um, any questions about this part of the, uh, the evening? Let's start down here. I was, I was reading something that disconnects between sort of the social intelligence yeah. and mathematical kind of rational reading, yeah. especially with probabilities. And so there's this example of, say, Mary, and she has two attributes. Yeah. And you know, she's a hard worker, and she believes passionately in women's rights or something. And this is like, what are the odds are that she's a bank teller? Oh, yeah. What are the odds <laughs> that she's a bank teller and a feminist? Mm. And you know, then they say, well, people will kind of would say that there's more odds. Yeah, like that's right. Yeah, once it gets a bit, yeah. mathematically. Yeah. But the counter to that, which I thought was interesting, I've always heard that sort of thing. Like, oh, these people are just sort of screwed up. No, they're not. Right? No. It's like, it's, <laughs> yeah. Right. It's like, yeah. why, why did the person who was giving this information about Mary choose to include that extra detail? Yeah, yeah. So that's sort of like Absol outside yeah. of that. And so I don't know if you had any thoughts about... Yeah, in fact, that was one of the, I gave that as one of the questions in my online course that just finished about oh. those kinds of reasoning. Because I, I, actually, that course was structured on, I literally in that five-week course, took them with their everyday intuitions about language 
and then showed them how you could reinterpret it in terms of mathematics and get very different answers. Um, you know, there's, it's been observed, uh, actually this came up on an earlier lecture, uh, that I, I mentioned, I heard something on the NPR, that uh, this guy from NASA who was looking at how people reason, uh, how in complex situations at the level of societies, we screw up badly because we are conditioned to think in these simple metaphors about stereotypes and so forth. And it just doesn't work in terms of the real world. I mean, we literally have to rely upon the probability in the mathematics, even though we don't believe the answers. Uh, and this, uh, the, the Monty Hall problem, for those who know about it, is a notorious example of a probability question that many people get wrong and some people can never see that they're wrong, even though it's a sort of an elementary argument to show that they're wrong. It's, it's, uh, it's just very problematic for the brain to wrap itself around it. I remember reading somewhere that neuroscientists think the function of the, of the cortex really was to keep track of complex social relationships among primates. To, and bestow an evolutionary advantage so that females could align themselves with more powerful males. And, yep. And that that would entail some abstract. Oh yeah, that's that's part of my that's part of my data. This is this is this, this all all of that stuff fed into this. I mean, it, 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 if you can judge an, a scientific explanation by how well the evidence fits, then I've got a winner. But it's still speculative. I mean, it, it, any evolutionary story is just rational reconstruction. So. Um, there have been some, there are some, you can perform, you can make some inferences from my thesis. And there was a cognitive psychologist in, in Canada, whose name I'm now forgetting, who did some research with young children. And, and it, the results she got were the ones that, that my thesis predicts. So there's been some confirmatory evidence, but you know, there's really no such thing as confirmatory evidence in science. It's just, there's evidence and you can see, okay, that's consistent. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, there's a problem about filming in that corner. Yeah, from the beginning. I can't pay attention, so. Okay, Thank you. so th that's a piece of clip that we, we can't use. Yeah, I forgot about that. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, you said that the math blossomed about 10,000 years ago, and that's one abstraction that we use. Yeah. But when did the abstraction of language develop? Do you know? Um, the, the most recent, it's a big, between 75,000 years, maybe 250,000 years. I mean, it's sometime in there, because it's, it's just, you've got to go by artifacts, and you've got to infer that people had language to do things. It was really tricky. There's, there's been a lot written about it. Interesting, when I started the work on this, which was probably 25 years ago when I started thinking about this, uh, it was hard to find a linguist who would talk about the evolution of language. It was regarded as a, not a respectable subject, but it actually, over the, next, over the last 15 years or so, it's got to be very respectable. Lots of linguists now talk about this. There's been books and papers and articles written about it. So all of a sudden, linguists began to talk about uh, the evolution. I mean, you can, it, it's understandable why it's it sort of somehow regarded as not respectable, because it, it is speculative. I mean, you've got, this, you've got this anthropological evidence, you've got other stuff, and you've got to infer that people had language and were doing things. And you say, well, how else could they have done things? So it's, uh, there's no artifacts. They didn't have books or things. It's, it's very, I mean, you get scratchings on things. So it has to be rational reconstruction. You have to tell a, com a convincing story. And you know, the time span is huge uh, as, to, as to when that might have come. Uh, it's, a, it's also tricky to explain it in terms of, of the brain structure. Um, so it's, it, it's clearly a phase transition in physics terms. All of a sudden, you've got, you're on one plane because you've got words, lots of words and vocabulary, and you're doing rich things with them. And suddenly, you've got recursive grammar. Now, there's no such thing as half a recursive grammar. Either you can recurse and iterate something, or you can't. So there has to have been a first brain, or a set, a set of first brains, that had the ability to do this recursive structure and not, because there's no halfway measures. It can't possibly be gradual. Now, physically, it's gradual, maybe. It could be gradual. But you have to tell a story that says lots of small changes in the brain, some, at one point, led to this phase transition and suddenly the brain le leapt to a different level of capacity. Um, that, that actually is how technology advances, um, but it seems that the brain advanced that way too. Uh, now I'm getting to the edge of my, I mean, this is not my domain. I mean, I read a lot of stuff to tell my story, but at this point, uh, I'm really at the limits of, of my, my training as to what's going on. Uh, Talk about stone tools, like actually that the, the recursive, the complex stone tools, the ability to sort of Figure out how to get from this thing to Tool making is, 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 yeah, a lot of the evidence is when people have various kinds of tools. And they've scanned brains, I <laughs> yeah. think. I'm not, this may be gossip, but um, where they've actually done, have them do the certain 
bulbous point things. Yeah, and, and they and the same like language generation. Yeah, and, and, and watching various creatures that use tools. You know, I mean, these these creatures that sort of figure out that you can put a stick and get the ants out of the thing. There's uh, other creatures have tools as well. So looking at tools is an interesting one. You basically like one of the things I read. You know, the, the stone axe probably wasn't a linguistic thing because you right. just it's a sharp thing. But if you think about tying that axe on a piece of wood and making an axe like that, that's kind of more complicated. That you've really got to think, if I, tie, I mean, if I tied this to that, then I've got something that, I mean, that's, that's mathematics, heaven's sake. That's, 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 they didn't have the equations, but they're thinking mathematically. Uh, so when tools got complex, but then you're into the question of when did this happen? Um, <laughs> barbed spears is another example. When did they first put barbs on spears? That takes, that, that's sort of language in the sense of complex thinking. And repeatable. Yeah, and repeatable, yeah. So, yeah, there's a, there's, a part, there's a moment when you've got recursion, but it's, it's got to be just a sort of phase transition thing that small changes just suddenly throw you up. But we do see that with, if you look at these technology curves, they're sort of S curves, and then there's a jump, then there's an S curve, and there's a jump. Uh, I don't know how many people I've seen draw that picture in the last year in Silicon Valley. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because they speculate. I mean, basically, that's a pitch to the VCs. You know, we're about to make another leap, so so give us twenty million dollars. <laughs> yeah, it takes it takes venture capital to do those leaps. Uh, yeah. Is there any neuroscience that shows why some people are able to access the part of their brain that allows them to grasp <laughs> the abstraction? Um, there may be some neuroscience that sort of gives some evidence, but I'm not aware of it, and I'd be, I, I, I would be very surprised if there's really convincing stuff. Um, I mean, you can tell what I think are plausible stories. Um, you know, the, as far as I can see, the most important thing to be able to harness that capacity is wanting to. Uh, the only distinction I'm aware of between those of us that become mathematicians and those of us that don't is that at some stage in our history, we decided we wanted to and we devoted a lot of time to it. Um, you know, there's certainly mathematics, like everything else, is subject to this 10,000 hours business. You know, anything you do for 10,000 hours, you tend to get good at, and mathematics is no different. Uh, if you look at the notebooks of very famous mathematicians or ordinary mathematicians from when they were children growing upwards, they leave behind, if they leave anything, copious notebooks full of arithmetic and of algebra and doing mathematics. They've got to be good by doing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of examples. Um, so I think it's just a case of something turns you on. You either have a relative or you see someone who's a mathematician and it just looks cool. You, for, some, for some reason, you decide you want to do it. And then you just devote a lot of time to it. Uh, if I had to put my money onto it and then, you know, there's some way of being able to cash out the bet, that's where I'd put my money on. It's just wanting to. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, it seems like a complex story about different brains. Well, I wonder yeah. because yeah. math is so aligned with music, whether yeah. mathematics brains. Yeah, they're both about stand formal. Similarly to. Yeah, they're both about formal patterns. The they're f yeah, they're both about formal patterns uh, that resonate with the brain. Music is patterns in time. It, it's fundamental to music that it's a pattern in time. But mathematics is patterns in space and relationships, but it's formal patterns. Um, I don't know if you came in when I, was, I did the pie movie. At the beginning, before everyone came in, I had the playing pie where you take pie and you take the numerals, you convert them into notes. Um, and at first, it's really discordant. Um, when you start piling them on and putting the harmonies in and things, then eventually it turns out to be music. But by then, it's really hard to tell where pie's gone because it's got into this mess. Um, yeah. In addition to tools, what about things like weaving? What ha is there a correlation Ooh. between that? Because that takes yeah. lots yeah. of complex uh, settings the, up in. There's a whole branch of math, a whole area of mathematics called ethnomathematics, which looks at mathematics to tie to societies. And there are whole books written about the innate mathematics in weavings of these different societies, in the Alhambra, tilings everywhere. Um, many societies have actually discovered through their art fundamental theorems of geometry about different translation patterns and so forth. You know, seven, there are only 17 distinct types of wallpaper pattern. Well, wallpaper patternists, people who do design wallpaper, have actually discovered them all. To be wallpaper, it has to be something that you can repeat over and over again, so you can put one roll next to the other and the pattern repeats. Well, there's only 17 ways of putting a pattern together. You know, forget the squiggles and things. There are 17 different structures that allow you to create wallpaper. And wallpaper design, mathematicians have proved that years ago. 
And wallpaper designers have implicitly discovered that because they've come up with all 17 and no more, because there aren't any more. And lots of things uh, in, in, uh, in, in the natural world and in different societies that are either artistic or just animal creatures that do things, uh, they turn out to be uh, mathematical. Uh, it, it's just not done as mathematics. Uh, it, it's, it's looking for patterns and, and making use of patterns. Still can't remember the title of that book where I do all of this stuff with the animals. I can't, I, this is really embarrassing. Um, uh, Lordy. Uh, in the break, I'm going to look and see what, what, what the title of one of my, It's one of my best selling books, actually, and it still sells very well. And I can't remember what the title is. Yeah, this is not a question. It's just a point that I want to make that when you mentioned what, what mathematics is about, it's like objects and their relationships and so So I think uh, computer programming or Today's programming languages they follow a similar approach, and there I think the the uh, they apply the mathematical principles also. Yeah. No. In fact, the uh, and in fact, I, I when you mentioned about the soap opera, yeah. a book came into my mind. It's called Bleeding at the Keyboard. For right. anybody is interested here, and they use the soap opera concept <laughs> to actually explain uh, explain Java programming language. Yeah. So, <laughs> Yeah. It's a book written by a, a professor at uh, Indiana University. Yeah. No, I, mean, when I, was, I, I did most of my heavy duty programming when I was a teenager and I, I wrote a, uh, and actually a text editor for, for a machine, uh, a, a machine with, 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 with a complete 8K of memory. So we had to be very careful with the, with the memory. But I literally wrote a text editor and this was in machine language. And what I was doing, and I, I, the feeling was I was literally writing a, a drama because I was saying this text is coming in, you're going to do this, you're going to do this, you're going to show this, and I was saying how you do stuff. It was, and I was in that world for weeks. Literally, I was in that world for weeks. I mean, I don't have the capacity for doing that anymore. I got older, but it was very much that feeling, that feeling of being in the flow of actually working on something. You're telling a story. Uh, and by the way, that thing about talking, mathematicians talking, you can do that with other professionals. You just film them at their professional meetings and cut the sound off. You've no idea whether they're talking about some scurrilous relationship of a couple of people that you, in your university or whether they're talking about the profession. If they're professionals, all of their gestures and their facial reactions and everything, it's engagement, it's passion, it's lots of passion, and you might just as well be talking about people. They're using the social brain, because it is a social brain. Right? You know, all of the evidence we've got suggests that that brain got complex and big to deal with social structures. That was the, that was the killer app. And so if you're doing mathematics, the more you can harness that, the better. That's why mathematicians make it look easy, because they've just got to the stage where they can engage in the same way as a person will engage with their favourite soap opera. And then it gets to be easy, in a sense easy. Now the difficult thing is you're trying to draw conclusions. In the soap opera, the conclusion comes very quickly, usually at the beginning of the next episode. In mathematics, you're left on your own to come up with a conclusion. Um, Interestingly enough, one project I did not long ago, and I'll finish, this will be the last one before the break, was for the uh, Defence Department, and they were interested in how they could, how much information can they get from surveillance video? Because it, you know, it's, it's video, it's, it, and, 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 and the intelligence analyst has the job, this is non-classified, so I can tell you this, the intelligence has the job of looking at lots of video and seeing how much can you, how, ca how can you recreate a story out of these distinct, distinct pieces of video from, from surveillance cameras in different parts of the world, from satellites, you've got all this video and you have to be able to tell a story, which in a sense means it's, the, their task is like the movie maker who's trying to put together the, the sequences. So we actually took as our test case the movie Memento, which has two time sequences forward and backwards. And the question was, that was a movie with an underlying story, and at the last episode, the last scene, you do find out what happened. The question we had was, can we develop a system, a protocol, where as you went through the movie and watched every, every sequence, could you predict the end? And the answer was no, we couldn't do it. Uh, uh, it's a surprising end. Um, and even if you can do it, you need to know, have a lot of meta-knowledge about, about things. But, uh, it was a fun project, uh, and you know, I got paid by the military to watch Memento <laughs> lots and lots of times. Um, it loses its attraction after a while, but, uh, <laughs> but not as madly as you think. It's still one of my favourite movies. Okay, we better take a break now and give my voice a rest, and in ten minutes' time we'll, uh, we'll hit the millennium problems. <laughs> is, it, is, is it the math instinct? It was the math instinct. Yeah, I couldn't, it seemed so hacked, but I'm, yeah, it's the math instinct. It's got a picture of a dog on the front, yeah.
The Math Instinct is the book whose title I couldn't remember. It's one of our best-selling books. And it's mathematics of warm and fuzzy things like cats and dogs and that kind of thing. OK, I wanted to finish with the Millennium Problems for a couple of reasons. One is it's still a... Uh, by design, it's meant to sort of encapsulate the frontiers of mathematics today. Um, and it's fairly topical. It's a, it's a, it's a new topic. It's, these are problems that only recently have been thrust into the spotlight as major problems to, to attack. Um, so for a course like this one that's meant to give an overview of mathematics, a lot of which has been about applied mathematics, using mathematics in the world, applying it in different ways, uh, thinking of mathematics in relationship with how the brain works. This is all about essentially mathematics for its own sake. Some of, it's got applied, some of it is applied, some of it's got applications, but this is about the pursuit of mathematics purely for its own sake. Um, the stuff that I did for 20 years, uh, in my early part of my career, just doing mathematics for its own sake. And uh, there's a $7 million of prizes available, um, technically now $6 million, because one of them problems has since been solved, but we'll come to that. Um, but there were $7 million that was set up as a prize, um, and you get $7 million by taking seven problems. Uh, this is the part of the talk where you'll understand the math. <laughs> From here on, you won't understand it, and quite frankly, I have very limited understanding, of, limited understanding of some of it and zero understanding of other parts of it. Um, these are seven problems that are undoubtedly hard and in many cases really, really complicated. And here's what happened. Back in May 2000, uh, in France, Paris, France, um, there was a conference. And at the conference, Sir Michael Atier of the UK and John Tate of the USA made the following announcement. A prize of $1 million will be awarded to the person or persons who first solves any one of seven of the most difficult open problems of mathematics. These problems will henceforth be known as the Millennium Problems. So this was a millennium, you know, if you remember 2000, everything was millennium. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that it wasn't clear whether it was one year or the next year. I mean, it was, you know, arguably it should have been the next year, but anyway, that's another issue. Um, and uh, this was the conference at the College of France. This was the, uh, the, the flyer for the thing. There was the usual things. There was uh, keynote speeches and so forth. And uh, this was one of the unusual things about this. At the time, I was editing a mathematical journal called Focus, which was the monthly newsletter of the Mathematical Association of America. And it was a mathematics magazine. I never got press releases. I mean, back then, I mean, I just didn't. But I got one for this, weeks in advance. I got an embargoed press release telling me about this conference. That already was kind of unusual. They'd hired a, a sort of a PR firm to sort of hype this thing because uh, this was meant to be a big public relations exercise in favour of pure mathematics. And what had happened was Landon Clay uh, was a Harvard graduate. He went to university wanted, liking mathematics, wanting to study mathematics, uh, found it well, in his words, too hard, but he went off and became a sort of investment banker and whatever, made, made millions of dollars, um, so, well, at least many millions anyway. Uh, so he, he actually made a lot of money in, in, in the markets, of stock markets or derivatives or whatever it was. Um, made a ton of money, uh, but always remained fond of mathematics and realised that mathematics, recognising that mathematics was getting a bad rap, that they, you know, people just weren't, kids were no longer getting interested in it, the universities weren't getting enough math majors, and it just wasn't getting in, it wasn't sexy enough for the, for the modern age. And so he, he recognised the power of money and says, if I put, if we have seven problems with a million dollar prize, the press will take note. And he was absolutely right, because this was a story all around the world. Um, uh, he actually set up a foundation or an institute at Cambridge um, called the Clear Mathematics Institute, uh, endowed it with $90 million. Uh, a friend of mine, Arthur Jaff, was uh, the founding director, and he established a committee of very famous mathematicians, world famous mathematicians, pinnacle mathematicians, to uh, Andrew Wilds, was the guy who sold Fermat's last theorem, by the way. Uh, their job was to come up with a list of seven of the most difficult, challenging, and important unsolved problems of mathematics. Uh, problems which were unlikely to be solved easily if, and, and, and within a few years. These were meant to be really gold ring problems uh, that represented the, the, the future of mathematics slightly beyond reach. And so they came up and uh, 
spent some time coming up with a list of seven problems. And they produced a list of seven problems. It would, some of the problems everyone agreed should have been on the list. There were some other problems that were sort of idiosyncratic. But what was clear was all seven problems were justifiably on the list. People might have chosen different ones for some of them, but they were all clearly major problems. Uh, here's some of the committee that, that put them together. Um, there's the clays at the front. Um, interesting that the, uh, he's the lawyer. This, <laughs> this is a guy with a lot of money. Um, it's very unusual to get a group of mathematicians posing with a lawyer. But there, was, uh, there were a lot of issues about $7 million. How do you decide when to award it? Who do you award it to? Who certifies whether it's correct? And so there was, there was a lot of legal wrangling uh, to get this thing going. And, uh, and there he was on the, uh, on the photograph. And then I've got Arthur Jaff on the back, Andrew Wiles, Ed Whitten, and Alain Conn at the, at the left. OK. So um, they put together this, uh, um, Landon Clay put together this institute and the prize. And the inspiration for the prize was what had happened 100 years earlier in the previous millennium, 1900. Because at the meeting of the, uh, the world mathematicians, the international mathematics meeting that, that happened every, actually they happened every four years, they had to move it to be in the year 1900. So twice professional mathematicians have agreed that the millennium is the year with two zeros. So enough of this nonsense about what, which is the millennium year. Mathematicians have spoken. It is the year that has two zeros, which is just as well, because that's what all the journalists, uh, the people who don't like it are the math teachers, because they have to teach arithmetic to kids, and you have to say, when do you get to 2,000? But that's another issue. Um, OK. Um, what he did, and this was very unusual, at a math meeting, if you're giving a plenary, you describe the greatest things that have been discovered recently. Or you maybe have a historical survey. He looked forward. This was a futuristic talk. Uh, he was a very respectable mathematician, very famous, so he could get away with it. Uh, and he got up and he said, listed problems that he said were really problems that mathematicians should work on and that they will mark the future of the discipline. If by, by looking at these problems, this is the way mathematics is going to go forward. Um, now, it turned out that some of them were not well formulated. Um, in one way or another, all but one of them were disposed of. Some were actually solved, some relatively recently, within the last 30 or 40 years. Um, but over the years, most of them were eventually solved, or else it was realized that there wasn't really a neat solution. Okay, so they were resolved. Uh, maybe I should say resolved or solved. Uh, all but one. And, of the, and the one that remained was a natural candidate to be one of the seven, and indeed it is one of the new ones. Okay, so I'll, we'll come to that one in a minute. But Hilbert had done this, and so it was a natural thing to do the same thing a little bit later, a hundred years later. And that's what uh, the Clay Institute did. And this is Landon Clay's own explanation of why he put this thing together. Let's read what he says. Curiosity is part of human nature. Unfortunately, the established religions no longer, <coughs> no longer provide the answers that are satisfactory and that translates into a need of certainty and truth. And that is what makes mathematics work, makes people commit their lives to it. It's the desire for truth and the response to the beauty and elegance of mathematics that drives mathematicians. So he was still, I mean, he had mathematicians among his friends, including Arthur Jaff, and he, who became, as I say, the first president of the Clay Institute. And he, uh, uh, he expressed that sort of love for mathematics in this statement. And here they are. If you order them in the right way, you get a nice Christmas tree. Um, <laughs> And this was the way they were ordered in, in the poster at the conference. And so you get this nice diagram thing. And I'll go through them one by one. Um, the first one is from computer science. The second one is from, uh, let's just say algebraic varieties or something. I mean, I'll, I'll come to what that's about. The, the third one is about, oh, we'll take a, it's about sort of surfaces in a general sense. The Riemann hypothesis is the one that was, uh, uh, on, on Hilbert's list from 100 years earlier. If you ask almost any mathematician at random, what's the most important unsolved problem in pure mathematicians, we're all conditioned to say the Riemann problem or the Riemann hypothesis. Um, for various reasons about its level of fundamentality, how long it's been around, how it seems to resist solution. Uh, I think we all agree pretty well that that is 
the problem that will be... We've always regarded that as more important than Fermat's last theorem, for example. This one always ranks much higher than that. Uh, Yang Mill's existence and mass gap, that's one from physics, uh, which is Arthur Jaff's subject, theoretical physics. Um, I mean, it's basically why do things have mass? Uh, it turns out that most of the basic fundamental questions in physics can't be answered by physicists. You know, why do things have mass? I mean, uh, you're going to have to do some mathematics to say that. Hmm? Well, <laughs> it's part of the picture. <laughs> it's part of the picture, but it still doesn't really answer the why. It sort of gives you the mechanism. Uh, okay, Navier Stokes equations, that's about fluids. Uh, I mean, you have to solve those if you want to design high performance yachts or airplanes and things like that. Um, and then there's another one from number theory to do with numbers. The Riemann hypothesis is number theory, it's about prime numbers essentially. And this is a sort of a generalized question, sort of related to the Riemann hypothesis at least in the branch of mathematics. OK, so let me go through and just say what these are, because these are a survey of what makes mathematicians excited today. And let me start with this one. Uh, this goes back to 1859, uh, Bernard Riemann. Um, this is the only one that was on Hilbert's list that hasn't been solved. Uh, everyone's favorite unsolved problem in mathematics. And part of the reason is it comes from very simple considerations about prime numbers, the atoms you know, the, the physicists have atoms, chemists have molecules, and mathematicians have prime numbers. They're the building blocks out of which you can ultimately build all numbers. And the way you put the prime numbers together to form a, or the, the other whole numbers tells you a lot about their property. The so-called prime decomposition of a number is like finding the atomic, the, the structure of an atom of, of a certain element, or finding the atomic molecular structure of, of some, something. Um, if you want to understand a number in terms of its primes, you can answer a lot of questions about it. OK, uh, the definition is a very simple one. So we're at the level of school mathematics now. A number's prime if its only divisors are 1 and n. So if you want to look for the primes less than 20, here they are. Except for the first one, they're all odd, because everything else will be divisible by 2, and, and, only t and so on, none of the others will be prime. 3, 5, 7, the first odd number that's not is 9, because it's divisible by 3. 11, 13, you have to skip 15 because it's divisible by 3 and 5. Then 17 and 19, you'd have to skip 21 because it's divisible by 3 and 7, and then you get to be 23 and so forth. So uh, those are the primes less than 20. Um, and the ones that are not prime are these. Uh, there are more of them, that's evident. So primes uh, look as though they're the sort of the, the smaller collection. Uh, more numbers seem to be not primes. All right. There are four below 10, 2, 3, 5, and 7. There are 25 below 100. So we increase by going up a factor of 10, but we haven't gone up a factor of 10 in the farms. It didn't go to 40, it just went to 25. If we go up to 1,000, we go up to 168. They've got to get bigger, but they're slowing down. The number of primes, nevertheless, even though the primes seem to thin out, and they do. If you go farther out along the numbers, the primes get fewer and fewer and fewer. They get hard to find. And yet in 350 BCE, um, Euclid proved by a rather elegant mathematical argument that there are infinitely many of them. So we know that there are infinitely many of them. If you want to see the proof, uh, log on to my math course. Actually, there's a YouTube video, a rather low grade, low fidelity, low resolution YouTube video of me proving this result on the course. So if you just title, if you just Google, if you went into the YouTube and you Google Keith Devlin Primes, you can watch the little video. It's a little five minute video. Uh, it was just a sort of demo for the course, but it's kind of low res, so it's hard to make it out. But um, it's, an, it's an elegant proof. OK, so let's do the following. The primes go on forever but they thin out. So you can ask yourself, at what rate do they thin out? Do they thin out in just some sort of haphazard way, or do they thin out in a somewhat orderly way? Well, here's one way you could look at it. You could say, let's go out along the numbers, go up to 10,000, and count how many primes there are. And then we can talk about the density of the primes. How many primes are there in 10,000? So if you divide the number of primes up to some point, by the number of numbers altogether, then you've got the density. How, how, what's the frequency, if you like, of the, of the primes? 
So if we look at these various numbers, we can go up to 10, 100. Well, we know that for 10, there are four less than there. So the density here is 0.4. We knew that there were 25 primes less than 100. So 25 divided by 100 is 0.25. There are 168 primes less than 1,000. So the density is 168 divided by 1,000. And if you keep iterating, those are the numbers. So now we've got some numbers that show how the primes are thinning out. The question is, can we discern any pattern in the numbers? Now, you or I could write a little, well, many of us could write a little computer program or just do it in a spreadsheet uh, <coughs> with a prime generator. And we could, we, could count the, we, we could generate these for large numbers. And we'd get a long sequence of numbers. Chances are high that there's none of us in this room, including myself, that could eyeball that in sequence of numbers and say, I've got a good idea what that sequence is. I don't think I could do it. Even if I could have done it, it was spoilt when I was a kid because a teacher told me what it was. Okay, so the question is, is there a pattern? The answer is yes, um, but it's not um, an easy one to spot unless you're one of the world's best mathematicians, like Carl Friedrich Gauss, who at a very young age in his early 20s, or maybe he was still a teenager, I forget, um, he said that that sequence is like the reciprocal of the natural logarithm. Now, you know, if you've spent a lot of your childhood, this goes back to the question about how people have become mathematicians. If you spend a lot of your childhood, as he did, working out the values of the logarithm function and looking at the reciprocals, you become really familiar with that. It's like a character in your favorite soap opera. So he can look at that sequence of numbers and say, oh, I've seen that before. That's the inverse of the natural logarithm. So he, at a very early age, conjectured that. The only way he could have done that was by doing a lot of calculations and becoming familiar with it. Uh, yeah. And that turned out to be correct. He couldn't prove it. He just recognised the sequence and said, I know what that is. I think I know what that is. It wasn't until some time later, uh, over 100 years later, that it was finally proved um, by, um, I think they were Belgians, uh, Jacques Hadamard and Charles de la vallée poussin the prime number theorem. At the least one of them was Belgian. Maybe there was a Belgian and a Frenchman. But, uh, they spoke French and they have French names. Okay. Um, and they finally proved this. It's now known as the prime number theorem. It's quite a, a difficult seminal proof in mathematics. OK, so we do know that there's an order to the way the prime numbers turn out. It's the inverse of the natural logarithm function. But I'm going to be mentioning lots of things in this particular lecture that you, know, you, don't, you, you probably don't know what they are. It doesn't matter. It's a function that's of interest to the mathematicians, and it's got definitions. And in the second part of this lecture, I'll be talking about things that I don't understand either. So. It's a, um, which was kind of interesting because I actually I wrote a book on this. Um, that's how I, I, I got to know about them. When the, when the Millennium Problems came out, they approached me and said, would you write... <coughs> well, they, put, they did two things. They approached a team of professional mathematicians, world-famous mathematicians in the different disciplines, and asked them to each to write a chapter of a book written by the expert on that domain. So they got world experts on each of the seven problems to write chapters of the book and bring that book out. It was many years before that finally came out. But they also said, we need a version of the book that journalists and high school students and people like that could read. And they came to me and said, will you write it for us? And I said, well, I don't know what most of these problems are. So they said, well, we'd like you to write it. Will you do it? So I, I went away and I started to do a bit of research into what some of these problems were. Well, I knew the Riemann hypothesis. I knew P equals MP. There were three of them I could have just sat down and written a chapter about. And then there were another four. And I thought, oh dear, <laughs> this is not going to be easy. Um, eventually, I decided to do it because it just seemed like a big challenge, but it wasn't easy. Um, and I really had to rely upon other people to help me out on, on a lot of occasions. OK. So we've got the prime number theorem. We know how the primes thin out. The proof, the, the steps that got us to that point, with the first proof, depended upon some work that Riemann had done. This this guy, Riemann. And he'd, oh, excuse me, I think I'm about to sneeze. <coughs> nope, the sneeze isn't coming, but let's try some water. Uh, uh, Riemann had done some work that showed that that density function, the thing that you're trying to approximate, you know, what, what function is it? Um, 
He found that that was closely related to the solutions of what's known as the Riemann zeta function. He denoted it by the Greek letter zeta, so it's now known as Riemann zeta function. And this is a function of complex numbers. OK, well, yeah, just bear with me. These are just words. This is a soap opera. Um, you've come into a soap opera, you don't know the backstory, but you sit back and relax and you can still get something out of the soap opera. Each of these characters had an interesting past, scurrilous past, there's all sorts of things you don't know about them, but they've got an interesting story to tell and you're just now uh, auditing this soap opera for the first time. So of course you don't know the background, but it doesn't matter, they're just mathematical things. Just like the characters in a soap opera, you just follow it on the surface. These are characters in the mathematical soap opera that play their own roles. So you've got this character called the density function, which I've explained, and then you've got this other character, this function of complex numbers. So it's some sort of mysterious character. And he's sure that they're related. Um, and then Riemann knew that that function, that, that equation, let's go back to it. No. Can I do it? Yeah. Um, it was this equation. This thing equals zero. Now, Riemann knew, <coughs> there comes that sneeze. Oh. I hope you're not listening to my, my is my mic feeding into your ear? <laughs> yeah, because uh, if I sneeze, I could, I could kill somebody. <laughs> I mean, yeah. OK, so you've got an equation. And Riemann knew some of the solutions of this equation. He knew. He knew, okay, I've only got about 20 minutes to go. I think I'll make it. He knew that all of the negative even integers solved that equation. If you plug those numbers into there, into that function, that zeta function, you get zero coming out. So plug minus two in, you get zero out. Plug minus four in, you get zero out. Plug those numbers in, you get zero out. He knew that. And then he just pulls this rabbit out of a hat conjecture and says, there's only two kinds of solutions. There's either these negative integers, and they're, they're, that's fairly straightforward. If you, look at the, if you look at the way that zeta function is constructed, you know, any first year graduate student can see immediately what's going on. Well, a first year graduate student at Stanford. Okay. Um, this, however, was bizarre. He said, there's only one other collection of solutions, and they're complex numbers of the form a half plus the square root of minus one times a real number. Where did he get it from? Well, when people, I mean, after his death, when historians looked at his papers, they discovered a bunch of calculations, but not many. Out of a small number of calculations, he made this guess about all the other solutions. All the, of which there are infinitely many. All of these infinitely many ones are actually have their real part equal to a half. So that was the Riemann hypothesis. Quite an amazing leap of faith to think this is probably true. Uh, one of the consequences of this, because it deals with prime numbers, is internet security. The public key cryptography codes that, get, that keep all of our communications with our banks and so forth secure, this relates to that. Uh, you're, in, you're into internet security when you start talking about the Riemann hypothesis. There are all sorts of algorithms to do with numbers that we know will work very efficiently on the assumption that this is true. Okay. This conjecture, it's been verified. You can, you can do computations about it. It's been verified at least to the first 1.5 billion solutions. We still don't know whether it's true or not. It's the kind of problem, for some problems, if you can sort of verify it for billions, you think it's probably true. Uh, for various reasons, mathematicians think this may well be true but not because there's a lot of evidence like that. That evidence is really worth nothing in, in assessing this thing. Uh, that's a question. It's been around uh, since Riemann's time, 1859. Um, most important result in mathematics, unsolved problem. So that's one of the millennium problems. If you go away tonight and you can prove it, <laughs> there's a million dollars waiting for you. Uh, yeah, I actually think I probably made more money out of the Millennium Problems than most other people's because I wrote a book. Uh, and it did not make a million dollars by any means, but uh, <laughs> it made more than most people did. 
it's also been calculated that if a the <coughs> these problems are so difficult that <coughs> if someone eventually solves them, if you calculate how long it took them in their lives to get to the point of being able to solve them, and you divide a million dollars by the number of hours they've spent, this is, this is <laughs> slave labor. You know, this, this would be pennies. I mean, it's, it's really, uh, uh, it's not a lot of money if you think of it in those terms. Okay. Um, if you want to make money, you found a company called Instagram and get bought out by Facebook, but that's another story. <laughs> so the question, is this thing true? Well, you have no idea. Prove it's either true or false, and, the and you get a million dollars. OK, look at the next one, the Navier-Stokes equations. This is about fluid flows. Another verse. We talked about this a little bit when we looked at aircraft. We didn't talk about this particular set of equations. But when you've got fluids or gases or anything flowing, um, you get these, particularly fluids, you get well, not really that much difference. Um, they were solved, th th these, these equations were formulated by Navier and Stokes in the early 19th century. Um, you can solve them numerically, and people do all the time. Uh, and these are fundamental equations in, in, in fluid flow. But there's no solution, other than computational solutions. There is, no one sat down and come up with a formula that solves these things. Um, the Millennium Problems ask you to come up with a formula, a solution. You know, in the same way that the quadratic equation is solved by the formula x equals minus b plus or minus the square root of yada, yada, yada. Come up with a nice little formula that solves these things. Well, these are differential equations, but it's, the question is, can you come up with a formula that gives you the solution? No one's managed to do it. Uh, this one's modern. This is computer science. It's the only computer science problem that got in there, and it was somewhat controversial. Um, though, I mean, anyone who knew about computer science said this is probably a really, really difficult problem. Um, it's not clear why it's a difficult problem, but it's been around. And it had the, the, the real problem was it hadn't been around that long. Um, it's a relatively recent problem. Uh, so when this came out, it was only sort of less than 30 years old. Um, but this is another question that has potential impact on today's world of communication security. Um, it's about how fast can you solve problems on computers. Um, the details aren't that important. Again, we're just getting an overview of the computer, of the, of the uh, domain. But essentially what it's saying is, um, well, well here's, here's a distinction. There are many problems where if someone gives you a potential solution, you can quickly check whether it's correct. You can just do a computation. On the other hand, finding that solution in the first place is not obvious. So there's a difference between checking a proposed solution and finding it. The classic example of this is known as the traveling salesman problem. Can you find a route where the salesman needs to visit 50 cities uh, and minimize the travel time or minimize the distance uh, in an efficient way, visiting one city each? If someone produces a candidate route, you can quickly see whether it's optimal. You can just see how far it is and see whether, what's going on. But finding the route, the optimal route in the first place, is there's no known really fast way of doing it. There are ways that get very close to being the fastest. The point is it's easy to check if something's optimal, but it's very difficult to find it. Essentially, the only way you can find it would be by enumerating all the routes and comparing them, and that's computationally long. So uh, the reason this is important in security is a lot of internet security depends upon having computations where if you have a secret key, you can very quickly unlock some information. But if you had to find the key in the first place, it could take you a long time. Now, if that equation up there was true, it would essentially mean there's not much distinction between those two. If you can check, it, if you can check that the key works, you could find it quickly as well. Um, whether that would cash out in practice is another issue. But in, in terms of theoretical computer science, this is a big, big question. And it does have implications. And it's been around long enough, and it's been attacked a lot by some of the smartest people around. And uh, this is a problem that's looked at by computer scientists and mathematicians. It really is a mathematical problem. It's not about practical computers. It's about theoretical computing devices. Um, OK, that's another one of them. So we've got uh, one about prime numbers. We've got one about fluids. We've got one about computations. This was one that was solved recently. This is the only one that's been solved. <coughs> And um, how am I doing on time? Actually, I can say a little bit about this one. Okay. Here's the issue. 
This came from Poincaré was trying to, the question, the, the, the big question Poincaré was asking was, can we understand the shape of the space we live in? We're in a universe. What's its geometry? What's its topology? How is this space configured? Um, for example, are we in the inside of a big sphere-like thing? You know, sort of infinitely far out. You can't get to the edges, but is it essentially a sphere-like universe? Or is it a universe like, a, like an inner tube, a torus? And we are actually on the inside of this big infinite torus, and, and, and so we, we don't know the edges are there, but in fact there are these torus edges, and if we wandered round in, in this universe, we might be going round this torus. And how could you tell what the shape is? Because you, the distinction is from the outside. You're on the inside, all you know is a space all around you, because the, the boundaries are way out there. The question is, are those boundaries, infinitely far away that they are, or whatever, are those boundaries essentially a sphere? Or are they essentially like a torus? You don't know, because you're never going to come to the boundaries. Well, the question was, hypothetically, can a creature that's locked inside the space, so they, you know, they, they had, the way they would describe it is that God is, on, or God is on the outside and God looking down can see that you're inside a torus or that you're inside a sphere. Can you, as a creature inside with a brain, figure out what the shape is without going outside and looking? That was the question. It's, it's the limitations of physics. Is there a way we could, in principle, figure out the shape of the thing? And he came up with a hypothesis and said, here's the idea. Imagine, so this is, this is a thought experiment. He said, imagine you get a space rocket, a space rocket, and you get in this space rocket, and you go out on this long journey. And on the, as you go out, you're going to splay out a, a, a string. You're going to stray out a string. You know, this is a sort of Hansel and Gretel thing. So you're going through, and this string is being splayed out behind you. And you're going to go off and round and round. And after a long time, you're going to come back. And so you've now put this loop of string through the, through the universe. And now you start to, you sort of do a little loop and you turn it into a lasso. And you start to pull the string through the lasso. So you're tightening the noose. If you're on the inside of a sphere, eventually the noose will just come right down. But if you're on the inside of an inner tube, and you'd gone all the way around the inner tube, you're not going to be able to do that because it's going to be stuck in that inner tube. So in principle, you could tell the shape of the universe by this process of extending strings and seeing if the lasso tightens up. Well, that was the hypothesis. The question is, does it work in a theoretical level? And the, con the Poincaré conjecture, and this is, this is actually, you, you ask the same question in, in any number of dimensions. The question essentially was, does this really work? Does this distinguish space? One thing I didn't tell you was those images I gave you were in a three-dimensional universe where the surface was two-dimensional. But we're not. We're in a three-dimensional universe where the boundaries would be high dimensions. So you're at least in four dimensions. So the story I told you was fine when you're talking about inner tubes and things, but does it work if we go one dimension up? The conjecture was, yes, it does. So if this was true, it means we can, in principle, figure out what shape our universe is from the inside. It was a conjecture, and then it was a millennium problem, and now it's a theorem. So Poincaré's idea turned out to be right on the ball. We can, in principle, I mean, not in practice, because that's a completely infeasible activity, but in practice, in principle, we can figure out the space. It was solved by this person, uh, Grigory Pillman, in 2002, only a couple of years after, although it took several years to verify the proof. And it, it, there's an interesting story about this. He, he's a reclusive guy, uh, lives in St. Petersburg, didn't really publish the results. He just put it up on a website for new mathematical results. Uh, very few of details, it was just a sketch of a proof. And many years elapsed before mathematicians agreed that it was correct, many years. And then when they did, they said they'd award him two prizes, the, the Fields Medal, which is the biggest prize for mathematicians, and they were going to order him, uh, award him the, uh, the Millennium Prize, the million dollars. He, turned his, he said no to both of them. He didn't accept either the Fields Medal or the Million Dollar Prize for reasons best known to himself. Um, he still lives in, with his mother in a small flat in St. Petersburg. It's a very interesting story in some ways. 
Uh, in other words, it's probably not an interesting story. He's just a guy that doesn't want to be part of the world, uh, of, of, of our world. But in any case, this was a brilliant piece of mathematics. So one of the seven has been solved. And we, can, we know now with, with, with certainty that we can figure out the space of our universe from the inside. Uh, this one's from physics. Uh, it's, uh, this is one I really don't know much about. Uh, so far, the problems are things I know something about. This one, I have no real understanding of this thing. Uh, it goes back to the 50s. Uh, it, if you can find a solution to this thing, it will say that particles have a minimum mass. Um, but that's about as much as I know about this thing. It's deep, heavy, modern theoretical physics. Uh, this one I know a little bit more about. Um, it's related to that Riemann zeta function. It's a sort of generalization. Um, and it's to do with distribution of primes and all that kind of jazz. Uh, but again, there's no need to sort of go into this, except to mention that these things called elliptic curves, they also play a role in internet security. Most of these problems turn out to have relevance to internet security in one way or another. Um, okay. And finally, the Hodge conjecture, about which I know zero. Um, and as far as I can tell, there is not a single living mathematician who fully understands what this thing says. Uh, how do I know? Because I talked to some of them, and they all said it says something different. Uh, uh, it's an extremely high-level general statement. That's, th this was a statement I think I, I sort of, after talking to people a long time, I said, is it OK if I put this in my book? And they sort of, first of all, said no. And then after a long time, they said, well, I suppose it's sort of OK. Um, and I, you know, I took that as authorization to put it in there. Um, I have no idea really what it means. And most mathematicians don't either, including people very close to this. It sort of says that there's this general thing that links two pieces of two different areas of mathematics. Um, those are the seven millennium problems. When I wrote the book, so th there they are, uh, and one of them's now been solved, so we put a tick against that. When I wrote the book, and this is the book, um, what was kind of, there were several things that were interesting about writing the book. First of all, I had to write a book about something that I really didn't understand. And I knew three of them, and the others increasingly became more problematic. And moreover, since I was writing for a general audience, I was faced with the problem about what, what, what can I say about these things that's of interest to anybody? I mean, other than these are big problems. These are Mount Everest problems. These are the K2 problems, the Mount Everest. These are the big challenges. Go to the moon, go to Mars. These were the big, big, big mathematical challenges. How can I describe them to a general audience, or even a you know, mathematically sophisticated general audience? In the end, um, what I decided to do was focus on their very non-comprehensibility to the experts. I mean, I thought that what was really interesting, that mathematics had reached a stage where mathematicians were able to formulate questions that were not only difficult to solve, but almost impossible for most mathematicians to understand. So we've got this degree of complexity now where groups of mathematicians have reached this great advanced stage that other groups of mathematicians, equally expert in their own fields, really don't know what they're doing. They just can't understand what this other group's doing. It's got that intricate. And so this Stone Age brain that 10,000 years ago started inventing banking is now able to produce this mathematics which is beyond most people's comprehension, beyond most experts' comprehension, and yet there's this great sense that if you solve any one of these problems, it will change the course of human history. These problems really are on the tops of mountains. And if you dislodge something on the top of a snowy mountain, you're likely to start an avalanche that's going to make a lot of damage down below. And so these problems, if any of them solved, an avalanche is going to come down. And it's not clear which way it's going to go and what it's going to affect. But if I had to put money on anything, and I don't have the money because I haven't won one of these prizes, but if I had one of these prizes, I'd put the money to try and increase it on the fact that any one of these problems is solved, it will change the world in ways that we probably can't understand now. Um, either because the solution itself has a big impact, or more likely, because the way it's solved will require insights that can't fail to have ramifications down the line for everybody. Um, and I think it was really remarkable that, these, that, that this committee put together these problems 
that when you get in far, and I got, into, I got inside, some of them I knew, as I said, some of them I managed to get inside by talking to experts. Some I just really couldn't fathom, except, I mean, I could get a general vague sense. But what was clear was the, these really are big problems, not just within mathematics, but solving them will really change the world in, in fundamental ways. Um, and they managed to sort of pick problems like that. Um, so the fact that you don't understand much of what I've been saying is sort of irrelevant because I don't understand it either. And that was the point. That really was the point that we've got this stuff out there that will affect the lives of our children and grandchildren when it's solved, or even if it's not solved, just by people trying to solve them. And yet it's at a level so far out that not only can not ordinary people understand it, most professional mathematicians can't understand it either. Um, that was not the case 100 years ago. That's different. That's, that's something very different in complexity. Um, well, that's a good place to end, I think. Um, that's the future. And as I said, I'll, um, I'm, I'm almost certain now that I'll give a course on infinity and related matters sometime next year. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the ride and I uh, look forward to seeing you again. Okay. <laughs>
Uh, it, it might sound as though there's some sort of hard and fast way of deciding it, but a solution is simply expressed in terms of formulas and expressions that already have meaning somewhere else. Now, what they wanted to eliminate was the possibility that someone would come up with a solution that sort of gave names to things that weren't understood. And the question is, has it really solved it? You know, um, you know, it's like the solution. You know, it's like someone on, a, on an exam paper who says, "I've solved this equation, but I'm keeping the answer secret." Well, you know, the teacher would usually say, "Either you tell me the answer, or you don't get any marks." Well, for this one, it was a case of, if you've solved it, you might not show me the actual answer but at least you show me how your answer gives the fact that particles have mass. So it was a, it was a reality check, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. I read uh, recently that mathematicians, <clears throat> this is a generalization, yeah. mathematicians are deathly afraid of being, being wrong in, pub in public, <laughs> under promote, mm -hmm. and then physicists don't mind so much, and they tend to err on the side of yes. promotion. Is there truth to that? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely there is, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've, sort of, I've sort of grown up. I'll, I'll speculate about this stuff all the time, but, uh, but I'm not trying to solve million-dollar problems. Um, it is part of the discipline. Um, it, it actually goes back to the question about whether things are true or, the, or they're just BS, like, like, like the stuff on the news. Um, there is this arbitrary of truth. There's this arbiter of truth, these things called proofs. To get something published in mathematics, it has to be, you have to prove it, and it has to be peer-reviewed, and the proof has to be iron-cast. And... So it's part of the discipline that you don't talk about something until you know it's true. You know, Riemann did something unusual. He, he gave a lecture about speculations. But you, you won't even get onto a... You, you're, if you put, submit a paper to a conference, it's not going to be accepted if there's not proven results in there. It's all about results that are proved. It really, in a sense, it's not mathematics till it's been proved. But that's why, you know, and that's Andrew Weil. He didn't tell anyone. He kept, he was, for seven years, he kept a secret so, because so he had why, to. Is yeah. it a difference in personality or is it a culture? Why it's a culture. culture. It's the culture of mathematics. If Andrew Wiles had said, I'm working on Fermat's last people, people would have gone around saying, poor Andrew. <laughs> I mean, oh, no, he's got married, he's got kids, what a shame, you know, what a waste and all these things. I mean, his life would have been made miserable. People would have started making fun of him. Now, maybe, you know, he had a good reputation, so maybe not. But uh, I can understand, I'm not, a, I'm not his caliber of mathematicians by any means, but I can certainly understand why he would, he would do that. Uh, you'd keep it a secret. Uh, and other mathematicians I've known who've been working on big problems, they don't tell you unless you but get really close to them. In physics, you can speculate. You can say yeah, in math you can make conjectures in mathematics, but no one gives you that much credence for doing it. It's not that big a deal. Is there an analogy to be made between, say, Einstein? It, it's not, he looked at the world differently, or yeah. he looked at gravity differently, and yeah. so the proving it, or the sort of the equations were sort of just a formalization. That's just the way he, he viewed phenomena that was actually the important work and that actually solved it. And like for some of these things, maybe it's a reframe, it's not the solution, it's the changing of the <laughs> viewpoint that would actually lead to the insight that would lead to a formalized... Yeah, no, it's, it certainly comes down a lot to how, the, to how you look at something. You've got to look at it in the right way. Uh, many cases, the key to solving a problem is to just look at it in the right way. And if you get trapped by... And if you get trapped, you, you just go down the tunnel. You get, you get trapped on the tunnel. Yeah, you've got to have some sort of annealing process where you just jump out of that trough and try again. There's, there is a whole bunch of heuristics for solving mathematics, for doing mathematics. Um, but you know, sometimes it takes someone who's prepared to devote their, essentially their whole career to one problem, like Andrew Wiles did. You know, there was good reason why he thought he could solve it, but to sustain that for seven months, for seven years, that's kind of unusual. Uh, and I don't know how long Perelman was working on the Poincaré conjecture, but it was a long time, and nobody knew that until he did it. Um, yeah, you don't go around if, and telling people you're working on these big problems. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever heard anyone saying they're working on one of these millennium problems. You just wouldn't do it. You just, it's just not part of the discipline. Y your respect among your community <laughs> would be just shot if you said you were working on that. Uh, so that means you've got to work on it in secret, and if you're lucky... I mean, it's a problem, because some of these problems... That means you're not going to be able to do global collaboration. Um, uh, one, thing, one interesting phenomenon that arose was uh, John Fry, who owns Fry's Electronics, lives 
actually Martinez and you know, lives and has his office in Palo Alto and things. Uh, he was a math graduate at Santa Clara, and a few years ago he established something called the American Institute of Mathematics. I'm on their advisory board, and a good friend of mine is the executive director. And uh, they're based actually next to Fry's, just in Palo Alto. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. They're, 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 they're building a, a complete life-size replica of the Alhambra down in Morgan Hill. Uh, and that's going to be the, that's the American Institute of Mathematics uh, when it comes out. Uh, and so that's, but um, he set up this, this institute um, and one of its sort of missions, although it, was so, it wasn't totally stated, was to apply a sort of a Manhattan Project approach to the Riemann hypothesis. He said, why don't we just try for once to get all the world's experts together and bring them together regularly to Palo Alto and eventually to Morgan Hill in the hope that that kind of Manhattan Project assault will eventually lead to a solution to the Riemann hypothesis. Uh, it was an interesting idea. It's still an interesting idea. Uh, it goes against the grain of mathematicians and the culture. And I worry that when they come together, they, don't, they keep their, hide, their cards hidden. Um, <laughs> it's tricky because the person who gets the credit for proving a theorem is the one who sort of puts the period at the end. You don't want to be that close. So when Andrew Wiles announced his proof of Fermat's last theorem and there was a mistake found, he really was in panic mode, right? Because he, he wanted to be the one that found that solution. And he refused to talk to anybody and show them his proof, except his former student. And he worked with his former student. And there were two papers published. There was Wiles' paper, and then there was a, another paper with his, his former student uh, that, that established some of the results. But he wasn't going to show people what he had in case they could finish the proof off. Um, it's part of the, the culture of mathematics. I mean, culture of all these disciplines is, is, is important. Uh, you know, it's not political so much, but it is cultural and it's powerful. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the problem with uh, Newton and Liberty. Yeah. Calculus. Yeah, there, there was this huge debate about who did it. Um, and it was not, not, as far as we know, not so much between the two individuals, although Newton apparently was very cantankerous, but their supporters. You know, I mean, first of all, there were, were English and German, and the English and Germans have always had this uh, love-hate relationship. Um, and, uh, well, when you're working a secret, that's when it's going to happen. Right? Yeah, um, but you know, it's, uh, it, you know, there's, there's egos on the line, there's careers and that kind of thing. It's, uh, uh, there's, there's the usual pettinesses and rivalries you get in any other discipline. Uh, but the secrecy, they, they, they're not the secrecy so much as the, the unwillingness to make conjectures. Uh, that really is a part of it. Well, if it's, a if it's a substantial conjecture, people will make it, like the Riemann conjecture or something like that. You'll make those kind of things if they're, if they're bold and backed up by some data. But just sort of making speculations about this might be proved or that might be proved, um, you just don't see it. It really isn't like physics in that respect. Uh, yeah? With that said, do you, as a great mathematician, find it interesting that the one problem out of all these learning problems that was solved was solved by somebody who didn't want any recognition of the It was kind of interesting. Yeah, it was, except yeah. either of the two prizes? Um, I mean, you can speculate all sorts of things about the kind of mind it takes to prove that kind of thing. Well, I think it's just, you know, people are different and that person happened to be the one that solved it. Andrew Wilde solved Fermat's last theorem and he's a nice, friendly, personable guy who gave a public lecture here at Stanford and uh, went on TV, they made a Nova documentary about him. He's a very shy, proud individual, but, you know, he recognised he'd done something big and just accepted the accolades and then went away quietly and did his own thing. Um, there are other people who just accept stardom. Really, they do. There was a guy uh, got a Fields Medal at Stanford in the 60s called Paul Cohn. He died a couple of years ago. Um, the moment he got his Fields Medal, he, his, he, solved, he solved the Hilbert problem. And when he solved it, he just left Stanford for the, and said, I'm going to take a break, and he went on a world tour and gave lectures and became a superstar. Um, that was just the way he reacted. Uh, he didn't resign from Stanford, I mean, and it didn't, didn't matter anyway because they were going to have him back, he'd solved the, the Hilbert problem. But he just became an, a celebrity mathematician. Um, people just react differently. I, I don't think you can draw inferences. Uh, you need to be labeled as a nerd, though. <laughs> we're all nerds in the business, well, yeah. There's a lot of people out there who don't think nerds are so great, you know. Yeah, well, yeah, but they don't live in Palo Alto. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, we don't know. You don't have pocket protection. You just have little phones on your hip. Right? <laughs> How many people are just making sure we don't see the phones on the hip? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, slide rule. Yeah, that was a, that was a nice badge you've been a, been a techie. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone. I'll see you. See you next year, maybe. 
For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.